spooky what we got here. First four of the season. One, two, three, and four. Game on. Hello, monarch butterfly enthusiasts. I'm Rich Lund, and I just got back from my morning run. And as you can see, I've got now four caterpillars under my care. It's June 23rd, 2018, and I still can't say that I found an egg yet, but I have found four caterpillars. Now, where I found them on my morning run is actually a great segue into what this video is all about. You see, there's something I actually learned my first year doing this that I've never actually talked to you about. And I'm guessing from the title of the video you clicked on, you're pretty sure you know what that is. Poison Ivy. And yes, I learned the hard way. Today, let's go show you where I got these caterpillars from. And while we do, we're going to learn how to identify Poison Ivy as best we can. Let's go. Morning running path. And sporadic milkweed. All right, so this is where I was out this morning, and you got a nice spread of all sorts of different types of plants, including milkweed here. Something when I do when I'm jogging, I will just kind of spot check, look at a couple of different plants along the way. It was from some of these plants right here that I found, the four that I found this morning. I want to check for more, but I also want to show you what else I found while I was looking. Poison ivy. Now this is actually the milkweed that I found the first one on. But it didn't take me long searching that plant to notice the poison ivy that was around it. There's not a lot too, it's kind of subtle. But I've learned how to spot it pretty quickly. There's some. And here's some, though it's got some sort of disease going on with the leaves. Those red spots aren't normal. So how do I know? How do I know that that's poison ivy? Well, let's show you how to identify it. Here's a plant that I think is a really good starting example. First off, maybe you've heard of the saying, leaves of three, let it be. And it's a good saying, but there's a lot of plants out there that have three leaves. The thing to also know about poison ivy is that it has only three leaves, and if you keep on following that branch down, you're not going to see extra leaves. You might notice that the stem goes all the way back to where it branched off, and there's only three leaves. For more leaves to sprout, the plant has to branch. So when we say leaves of three, we really mean only leaves of three. And also, there's a whole lot of variety of poison ivy. The leaves don't have to be exactly the shape that you're seeing right here. But I think this is a good starting example. The central leaf is symmetric, whereas the two outer leaves, these things are mirror images of each other, but this, let's say, upper half is going to be different usually than the lower half. And I can only say usually. I have seen some leaves that look really close to being symmetric. This one is quite different. Now there's other sayings out there too for poison ivy, like if these two leaves are shaped like a mitten, it'll itch like a dickens. I've heard that one before, but this one's not really mitten shaped. What they're usually talking about is the notch that's right in here and would be right in here. But you can see on this leaf it's got multiple notches. I don't know that I'd look at this leaf and at first think, oh, there's a mitten. And I think it's also pretty neat to see on this plant here, here's some sprouted up ones. Usually the younger leaves have a little bit of red to them, or in this case a lot. There's just such variety out there. You gotta really look at a lot of plants before you start to get it. Okay, let's show you another one. All right, here's another, and as you can see, right by a milkweed plant. And notice, this one's got quite a notch here in one of the left and right leaves, but the other one doesn't. So again, it's usually a mirror image of the two, and they are not symmetric leaves themselves. This lower half is different than the top half, but they aren't always going to be mirror images. Some sources that I saw online trying to describe to you poison ivy say that they are always identical. No, they're not. This top half here, though, is definitely a much more symmetrical leaf than what these other two are. And here's some young leaves sprouting up, and as you can see, there's the red. And I think that this is an important video to make because, I mean, you can see, if I didn't know what this plant was, and my hands going around here trying to check underneath the milkweed leaves, 
I am going to be itching something fierce. It's not true that poison ivy is going to be everywhere that milkweed is growing and people are looking for monarch eggs, but it's in enough places to where this video I think is worthy of making. Let me show you some more. All right, this one's a really good example. All right, so we got the younger red leaves right here. Check this out. We've been seeing poison ivy that has multiple notches in these side leaves. This one's got only one, just one notch right there. This would be the kind of leaf that, yeah, I would say that this looks like a mitten. You can see that not all the leaves we've looked at look like this. So it's not something you can really trust 100%. But one thing you can say that we're always seeing, leaves of three, and then if you follow the stem down, there are no other leaves branching off from that same stem. Only three per stem. Now here's some more, here and here. Kind of in a little patch of it. But I'm not surprised. Take a look it up here. Any guess what that is? These here are some very giant leaves, what I'm pointing to, of poison ivy. Huge leaves. Here's a side leaf. With just the notch. Right there. Here's its central leaf. Here's another side leaf. Let's get a closer look. Now these ones are really huge. I mean, this one right here, that's about the size of the palm of my hand. So they can get quite big. Usually though, the ones that you're not going to as easily see are going to be the small and younger ones. And those smaller and younger ones actually have a little bit more of the oil that causes the allergic reaction. We can see again, the central leaf of the three, fairly symmetrical. The other two are like mirror images to each other most of the time. They do tend to have a notch right here, but not always. Here's one where the notch is kind of kind of curvy here at the end. So they don't necessarily come to points. There's a lot of variety in the shapes that they can have and colors. Okay, so picture it. You're out in the woods. Maybe you're getting good at identifying poison ivy, maybe not so much. But either way, you just noticed that you did come into contact with some. What do you do? Well, the first thing to understand is that poison ivy, it's all about the oils. It's on the leaves, it's in the stems, it's in the roots even. And so if you've got that oil on your skin, what happens is your skin will absorb it. When I'm out in the field, something that I've got in my backpack with me is 91% rubbing alcohol. This is one of the better solvents to try to dissolve the oil with. Now, if you don't have this, but you got like a bottle of water with you, you should still try that. But water and oil don't necessarily mix as we learned back in grade school, right? Water is a polar molecule, oil is nonpolar. And isopropyl alcohol, while it is slightly polar, it's just not nearly as polar as water. And so it mixes a little bit easier with the oil. The higher the percentage, the better. So I go with 91%. That crow is letting me know whose turf I'm in. Anyway, I also carry with me some paper towels and a little baggie so that way I can quickly apply it if I need to. You want to try to rinse off and dissolve the oil as quickly as you can. And just using the alcohol isn't enough. Once you've rinsed there, you should then get home and thoroughly rinse with water more than you think you need to. Now while I'm sitting here talking about this, I'm also showing you some other footage of different leaves that I've seen too. I really think when it comes to being able to train yourself to identify poison ivy, the more pictures you look at, the better. You don't want to get locked into thinking it looks a certain way, and really you've only looked at just one variety of it. You want to see multiples. So I would recommend, if you're finding this video interesting, don't just stick with mine. Go see what other videos are out there on YouTube that are showing you poison ivy. But I will say this. I've seen some websites describing how to identify poison ivy, and they are telling you some strict rules that I know don't always apply. I also saw one website that said that poison ivy cannot climb up a tree, that it's not really like a vine. And that's just false. I've seen poison ivy climbing up a tree before. Just can't find any today. So again, let me repeat that. Don't just trust only my video. Cross-reference. Examine other videos out there. Get a general idea from multiple sources as to how to identify this plant. Now before this video is done, I did also want to just bring up some of the misconceptions about poison ivy. It's not contagious. If somebody has the rash and they're even scratching it and then they touch you, that's not going to necessarily transfer it to you. 
I say not necessarily because we're assuming that the oil is no longer on that skin. If somebody just came into contact with it and the oil is still there, yes, touching that area and then touching you, it could definitely spread the oil to you. But if they have had, you know, a couple of showers in between in a few days, them having the rash is not in any way going to transfer it to you. It just seems like it because a lot of people don't always understand how the oil works and how persistent it really is. There have been stories about people using gardening tools in the garden where there was poison ivy, getting poison ivy and not cleaning off their tools. And then the next year the oil is still there and they get poison ivy again. It might sometimes seem like poison ivy spreading. In fact, you can talk to people and I have before and they've said, look, I don't care what you're saying. I know that it spreads because I was scratching it here and then later on it showed up over here. The thing is the oil, when it absorbs into your skin, it will absorb faster into some areas of your skin than others. The skin at the top of your forearm and on your hand, those are kind of different than what's underneath on the underside of your forearm. So the amount of oil exposure that you have can cause a quicker or slower response to it how quickly it absorbs into different types of skin. And then also, if you've got some oil, let's say, you know, I'm riding my bike today, if I had some oil transfer onto me and it was on my pant leg, and later on I go to ride the bike later on that day and some other part of my body comes into contact with some of the oil that's now on my bike, well, I might have a delayed reaction there too. I might break out on one side and then break out a few hours later on the other, and I might think that somehow it spread. Once you understand though how the oil works and that it is all about the oil, you can really take great steps to prevent it from happening. So I hope you found this video useful. I was really hoping that I'd find a few more caterpillars while I was out here, but apparently I found the only four that are out here that I'm going to find. Still, I think and I hope that this is some valuable information for you if you're going to be out there hunting for monarch eggs. Thanks for checking this out. See you next time. I'm going to get out of these crows' territory because I don't think they're happy with me.